Hello and welcome to Generation STEM. I am Gabriel Salgado. In this series, we are going to explore the worlds of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM. These careers have left their footprint in our world from the invention of the wheel to the exploration of space. Scientists have given us a new vision about the laws of the universe and millions of lives have been saved thanks to advances in medicine. In Generation STEM, we are going to meet students, teachers, and professionals who share with us their experiences and the opportunities for young people like me to be a part of this amazing world. Generation STEM is brought to you thanks to the help from the National Science Foundation and its collaborative association with the Center for Games and Impact, VEME, Eline Media, Haku, and Arizona State University. Today on Generation STEM, surrounded by maps and computers, a young meteorologist tells us if we should use an umbrella or a coat. Her love for science took her to NASA, and now she is responsible for the success of many space missions. Our planet is desperately asking for help, and we meet someone who cares about the environment and also teaches others how to do it. The director of a science program tells us about the advantages of studying a STEM career and how to do it. All these and more today on Generation STEM. Today we are starting with meteorology, a science that helps us study and predict the different atmospheric activities which are important for agriculture, travel, or our daily lives. Ariel Rodriguez is a young Cuban meteorologist whose TV reports about the weather conditions make us decide on taking a coat out of our closets or going to the beach on the weekend. The weather changes completely every now and then because it's changing all the time. What's going on now is completely different to what's happening five minutes from now, especially if you live in the Midwest or you live in Texas. When I got to the U.S., I was a teenager and here I actually saw the real opportunity and that's when I pursued it. I was lucky enough to get a scholarship and it paid for the first two years of college, but the science, it's hard. You have to study a lot of uh, math, a lot of physics. I actually ended up with a minor in math and a minor in physics. The first class I had, it was in a big auditorium. It was about 150 people or so. And four years afterwards, we were about 34 people. That's the graduating class. The challenge of forecasting and getting it right. You don't always get it right, but you try to get it, you know, as best as you can. El viernes, condiciones relativamente menos inestables. We've come a long way since satellites were launched in the 50s and 60s. You know that meteorology has advanced enormously. In this computer, for example, we're seeing the infrared uh, satellite image. This tells us the uh, temperature of the clouds on the uh, top of the clouds. The colder they are, the more likely they are to have heavy rain, thunderstorms. Here, the redder they are, the colder they get. Here, this is our system. We call it MAX. It's from the OLEOSI. Basically, here we draw the fronts. We show the whole meteorological, you know, conditions at the moment. We do our forecast here as well. And here, it's another computer that we get the alerts, the weather alerts. The, the latest one, it's the aviation forecast from the National Weather Service. They get the, uh, the raw data, all the information from satellites, from the suns that they send every day. And uh, in our case, we have to translate all that very scientific knowledge into something that the general public can understand. So I tell myself every day before I go on TV, your grandmother has to be able to understand that. And she's like my audience, like I call her and I asked her, did you understand it? And she's like, yeah, you said this, this and that. So if, if I accomplished that, it means I did a good job. 
So this is basically what we call the green screen or the chroma key. What I see all the time behind me, it's a green screen. I can't see my maps. I see my maps here. This is my reference. To my left and to my right, it's the monitor. And also in the front of me, I see myself. And those are the three points what I look at. That's how I know that basically what I'm looking here is a front and here's Florida and here's the rain. So it's basically like being a mime. I have to make sure that I point to the right direction. It takes a little bit of practice. Sometimes you have to fake it a little bit because you know, I have to turn my head so that it looks like I'm looking behind me without giving my back to the audience. So it takes a little practice, but you know, you make two. So basically our mornings are pretty hectic. We do uh, two weather uh, forecasts for the radio, ESPN radio, and right now I just did 94.9. It's another local Miami FM uh, station. So I tape their forecasts in my phone with this little microphone and I send it over to them. It is, it's an art. Everything has an, an art to it. It's, it's a lot of science, but uh, it's like a picture that you look at and it changes every day all the time and you have to try to see how it's going to change and predict how it's going to look tomorrow. Right now we still need more investments, we need the government to keep investing, the private sector to keep growing and it's, it's a very hard business because you have to try to know what's going to happen in a big chunk of atmosphere and you have different points and you pretty much try to project that into the future. We need a lot of scientists, we need a lot of Hispanics, a lot of females, because that's also a challenge. Ariel is one of those people who always knew what he wanted. In his case, Ariel is very satisfied with his career as a meteorologist and the service he provides to his community. If you would like to find more information about this and other STEM careers, please go to our website, primotv.com slash generation STEM. When we return, the work of an engineer takes us closer to conquer the cosmos. Can you imagine being at work thinking about planets and stars all the time? Well, satellites and spaceships are Ruth Fragoso's everyday working tools. She is the star of our next segment. Her parents came from Mexico and supported her so she could succeed in life. Her passion for math led her to study engineering, and that was the beginning of a great career that took her directly to NASA. Let's see Ruth's story and her love for her profession. My name is Ruth Fragoso. I was born in Los Angeles. My parents are from a small town in Durango named Guzman and Hernandez. They emigrated to the U.S. and worked very hard. My dad was a cook and my mom used to help him. Their main goal was always to support us so that we could all get a good education. They made sure they supported us through it all. In school, I was always doing my best. I was a good student and I always loved math, so I was frequently looking for things related to the fields of mathematics or medicine. And then I was invited to a program at UCLA where I was introduced to the, uh, to the field of engineering. It was something completely unknown to me, but I took a major risk by enrolling. Sometimes I wasn't very comfortable because there were no Latinos and I felt like an outsider at the school. But I made the effort to keep going and I graduated from the university as an engineer. There was an event where, well, there were many important companies recruiting and I had the opportunity to get an interview with JPL, which is a jet propulsion lab for NASA. They saw my potential as a leader. I was involved with many organizations at the university, um, and that opened the doors for me, and they offered me a position to, um, to come work over here. We're uh, expecting to start at 5, 13, 17, UTC. What I do here is direct the simulations that engineers use to practice all the operations that they will have to perform when running space missions to planets, comets, or asteroids for NASA. I evaluate the events that, uh, that will happen during a mission, its timeline and all the different things that are going to happen. The launch, entering orbit, making a maneuver, uh, to enter the atmosphere of a planet, all the science involved. Then we correct what needs to be corrected, make sure everything that needs to be there is there so that the mission can be, can be a successful mission, a successful endeavor. Very often people think, oh no, I'm not good at math or science. And so they quickly give up without even trying to go further. 
The fact is that you have to make an effort. Not everything is going to be easy. There are subjects that are easy for some people and others that aren't. For example, I love math, but science, not as much. But what I did was learn how to see science in a different light, in math mode. And I did my best to work on that aspect as hard as I could. What tends to happen a lot in our community is, is if we don't understand something, then we don't even make an effort to do it. The fact is that even when we don't feel comfortable, even if we don't know what the future holds for us, we must push forward and keep trying our best. See what we can discover and we will find something. We will find success. My advice to you is that you keep going forward, keep seeking and stay focused because there are many distractions. But when you set a goal and work hard every day to achieve that goal, no matter what, you will succeed. Engineering has opened up my world and I've had the opportunity to meet amazing people. Very positive people. People who say, yes, we can, and continue to wonder about the universe. Hello, I'm home. It's also helped me in my, my personal life to have a better economic position and better opportunities for my family. There are very few Hispanics working for NASA, but they all shine. When we have a successful mission at NASA, I feel happy that, that I was able to contribute to all those discoveries that we continue to make. Ruth tears down the old myth that women are not fit to be in the engineering world. Today, she is a very well-paid scientist who loves her work and talks about the importance of Latino women at NASA. Her mind may be in the skies, but her feet are very well grounded on Earth. When we return, we are going to the New York Museum of Natural Science to meet someone who has made environmental protection his passion. We've all heard about global warming or that the glaciers are melting. This problem is getting bigger every year and many species are struggling to survive. Unfortunately, we don't seem to pay a lot of attention to these warnings from nature. Santiago Flores is a young Colombian anthropologist who has devoted his life to raising awareness on the importance of environmental conservation. He works at the Museum of Natural Science in New York, and he will talk to us about what he is doing to create awareness and teach others about our planet. My name is Santiago Flores. I am an educator in environmental conservation. I'm Colombian, and I work at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. An environmental conservation educator teaches people about the environment, the different problems humanity is facing due to global warming, and how to find the best solutions. The first step is to understand what the environment is, all the wonders of the natural world that surround us. The second step is to talk about the problems we are facing, problems such as global warming, the acidification of the oceans, and deforestation. The third is to talk about what steps we can take to find solutions, not only at the individual level, but also at the institutional level through legislative action. I started in this career when I was studying and training in anthropology. In one of my expeditions in the country, I had the opportunity to get to know the culture of the Kogi tribe. The Kogis are an ancient civilization from Sierra Nevada in Colombia. They do have a very different view of nature than we have. While we in the Western world see nature as a separate entity from us, they see nature as an integral part that unifies all of us and everything. And they understand that without nature, we humans simply cannot exist. And since then, and after observing everything that is happening in Colombia, the United States, and all around the world, I got interested in environmental conservation. After I finished my career as an anthropologist, I applied for Col Futuro, which is a government program in Colombia that financed my studies at NYU. There I received my master's degree in environmental conservation education, which means I'm an educator in environmental related issues. And during two years, I worked on my master's, which I just received. And now I work at the museum as an educator. The Discovery Room is a very special room in the museum because it is interactive. People can come in and learn through interaction and exploration. We have all the themes that you can find throughout the museum, like dinosaurs, animals, evolution, cultures, 
but everything in this room works by interaction and exploration. Many of the children who visit us come from very urban areas where the only animals they can interact with are cats and dogs, and since this is New York City, sometimes pigeons and rats. All the animals we exhibit are a way to open their minds to the wonders of nature. We have insects, lizards, we have, we have snakes, tarantulas, and what we try to do is teach them and try to make the kids feel comfortable so that they can touch them, so they can explore and learn through them about nature. For example, Marvin is a very special animal. He's a gecko. A gecko originally from Pakistan and Afghanistan regions, but what makes him so special is he's an albino. So this gives me an opportunity to talk to the students about albino animals and their genetics. We can also talk about strategies of adaptation. And I like to talk about how animals adapt to global warming. Lizards, like many other reptiles, cannot control their body temperatures as mammals do. Therefore, if there's any temperature change in the environment around them, it affects them a lot. It affects their ability to move around, and it greatly affects their population numbers. Insects are fascinating to me because most people have a phobia of them. It's very interesting to me when I see adults coming here being very afraid of insects. So one of our tasks is to show people that insects are an important part of nature and very important for humans. We talk about their role in our environment and their role in our future. For example, a study by the United Nations says that we will have to eat more insect-based food to have a more sustainable society. The most fulfilling aspect of being an environmental educator is the possibility of exploring and learning how wonderful and amazing the world around us is. I would invite students that are interested in this subject to consider pursuing a career in environmental conservation because they will not only learn about the marvels of nature, but also learn about ways to contribute to society and help guarantee the survival of the human species. The life chain on our planet is unique and fragile. The weakness of a single link would be enough to endanger our lives. Mistreating nature is mistreating ourselves. To know more about STEM careers, go to our website where you will find lots of information about universities, financial support, helpful tools to choose a career, and much more. When we return, a counselor tells us what to do to study a career in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. The fear of math and not knowing about the possibilities of a STEM career are some of the reasons why many students don't want to study them. However, everything from a coffee we heat up in the morning to a surgery that can save our lives depends on a STEM career. Who else can be better to tell us about these careers than Monica Minchala? She is the director of Arcos, a program that provides services to students at Miami-Dade College. Monica tells us about the different STEM careers, their advantages, and how to access them through financial aid and government support. My name is Monica Minchala, and I am the director of the Arcos program at Miami-Dade College. STEM is divided into four basic fields, which are science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. For example, under engineering, there are at least 10 categories. So if someone follows a career in, let's say, in mechanical engineering, which it has a very broad range, there are lots of different opportunities. I think one of the reasons why students don't want to pursue a career at the university in a career here with STEM is that they don't know the different opportunities that exist under these careers. We are talking about professions that are highly lucrative, very stable, and most importantly, these are careers in which the U.S. government is investing a lot of money. Because not that many students enroll in this program, and we need more professionals in those fields. ARCOS is a program designed to guide students and offer them opportunities that they may not be able to find in other universities. So from the moment the student enrolls in Miami-Dade College, we provide support in, in a form of intense courses in mathematics so they can focus on getting prepared for classes at a university level. We also provide mentoring programs where they receive tutoring from students who have already graduated from Miami-Dade College. I think that in the Latin community, it's 
very common that perhaps the parents don't have the means to gather and save up all the necessary funds to enroll their children in a university level education that, for example, a four-year college. An alternative plan that parents can have is to help their children and encourage them to look for all financial assistance available that can help them apply for financial aid. If they don't speak English, at least you can give them the support they need to succeed. One thing we always recommend to all students is that they apply to uh, financial aid, which is an assistance, a federal program that is open to everybody, to all persons, but of course you have to be eligible in order to apply. Many of our students wait until the last minute to apply because they don't know the process. So one thing that we do is we advise all of our students to apply early. And early means that they apply in February because aside from receiving federal aid, they can also qualify to receive all the benefits they may need at the state level. There are many types of aid that are provided not only by universities, but also in high schools when you're applying for the very first time. We tell students all the time that if it's their first time applying, to not be afraid to seek out help. Tell your counselor, this is the first time I'm applying and I don't know what I'm doing, so can you please help me? I think this is a great opportunity for students because they get to take the same classes as in a university, but doing the first two years at a community college is usually half the cost. And all colleges have an agreement with at least one university where if you graduate from the college, admission into that university is guaranteed. Approximately half of Latino students that go to a university start in a community college. I think this happens because colleges offer the opportunity for students to, to start their higher education with a, with a very low cost. This also allows the opportunity to continue living at home and keep their, keep their families together instead of apart. Our projections indicate that by the year 2022, there will be more than 2.5 million jobs in STEM-related fields. Our careers here at STEM have, they have the opportunity to offer more stability in the, in the areas of employment but also to offer great financial stability and growth in the long run. Keep in mind that STEM careers can make the difference and bring a better and fuller life to us and others. Besides all the knowledge we can get, these specialties are well paid, bring stability, and they are very important for human development. Do not forget to visit our website where you will find a lot of information about STEM careers, financial support, or how to register to different universities, among other topics. We have come to the end of our show. Thank you for joining us and see you next time on Generation STEM.